Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at bioinformatics. And as you can see on this uh, graph here that I found on the internet, it has the word bioinformatics written here, but it really um, is a field that interlaces with a bunch of different fields that are really quite broad and diverse. You know, everything from biology to evolution to informatics to mathematics to transcriptomics, genomics, statistics, a bunch of different fields. And so in this lecture, we're only going to be able to look at a few things. Um, some of the main things that we'll be looking at would be the Human Genome Project and then a few of the tools that we can use in bioinformatics. So the Human G Genome Project um, began in 1990. It was funded um, by the U.S. government in collaboration with some other entities as well. And the goal was to understand the human genome and the role that it plays in both health and disease. And of course, this was what was touted as the big payoff. And not only has this come true, but many, many other um, achieved goals has come about through the hum Human Genome Project, probably some of the best money spent by the government uh, uh, in maybe ever, but really amazing, um, lots of amazing things have come out of the Human Genome Project. So let's remind ourselves that the human genome is about 3.2 billion bases long. So if you could somehow tie all of the chromosomes together and line them all up um, and stretch them out to their full length, that would be about two meters of, of DNA. Um, and that's in every single cell. So somehow that two meters of DNA folds up and coils and gets all up inside of a cell. Um, if you, to think about 3.2 billion is sometimes hard, so I like this analogy. So on, on this page right here, I have 5,000 bases that are, that are listed here. And if you think about fitting 5,000 bases per page, uh, or 5,000 bases on a one single sheet of paper, which is about what you can fit if you don't make them, uh, if you make them small enough, it would take three pallets with 40 boxes per pallet with 5,000 pages per box with those 5,000 nucleotide bases per page, that would get you to 3 billion. So, you know, this is about what it would take to write the human genome of one person. So, in the beginning of this project, most of the first years were used in um, improving the technology and trying to figure out how to sequence DNA in a more efficient manner. And so, this was mostly done actually on other organisms like this worm. Uh, fruit flies, mice, and other organisms as well. But once all that was uh, figured out, then we could really start to work on the human genome. One of the main ways in which the human genome was originally sequenced was through a process where you took chromosomes, you chopped them up into pieces, which were now DNA fragments, and then you went through a process that involved both PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which we talked about before, and sequencing, DNA sequencing in order to actually read the genetic code of each of these pieces. But now you've got this puzzle of all of these pieces and you've got to put them back together. Well, you, the good thing is that these pieces, you do this enough times to where they overlap and then you simply just find the overlapping pieces, put them all together and eventually you come up with a, a um, fully assembled chromosome from the beginning right to the very end. There are other ways of doing sequencing as well. Um, and there's some new ways of doing sequencing that is much more efficient and quicker um, today. And these are called next generation sequencing methods. And I invite you to go and look those up online as well. It's just a picture of maybe what a sequencing center might have looked like during the time of the Human Genome Project. So the, what comes off of the computer, a laser actually goes in and is able to read each of the different nucleotides. And the peak tells you what the nucleotide is. So a blue peak here indicates that that nucleotide is a C. A green peak indicates a nucleotide of A. And you can see every once in a while you get an N, which means it's not sure, at least the computer wasn't sure to be able to call which base pair it was. And this is why also overlapping, you have these multiple layers that check each other. So whenever one sequence doesn't quite read the base pair correctly, another sequence will. And that way you can get 100% um, coverage and be very confident about each of the bases that are being called. So if you think about it, this is a sequence about a thousand base pairs long, and that's about the length that they were getting of the reads. So it would be a puzzle piece of about 3,200,000 puzzle pieces um, 
plus all of the different ones. So that's just uh, that's assuming that you had just enough to overlap barely. But really, there were many more than this. And so the computer had to put all of these pe puzzle pieces together to put, come up with the Human Genome Project. So in 2000, 10 years after the initiation of the project, um, it was announced that 80% had been done. Uh, in 2001, 90%, and then in 2003, the Human Genome Project was complete, at least the sequencing of the DNA. Now that was only one part of the project, um, was actually to just get everything sequenced. From that, though, there's now multiple pathways that still need to be um, continued to have lots of research done on them. If you look at some of the milestones through here, you can see that in 1995, the first bacterial genomes were sequenced. And then in 1994, you get the first archaeal genomes. In 97, the first eukaryote, Saccharomyces um, here, which is yeast. In 98, that uh, worm that's called um, C. elegans, it's a nematode worm. So Arabidopsis, the first plant. And then again, like I said, in 2001, to 2003, you had the first release and then to the fully completed genome. This is our university president, uh, Matthew Holland. And then more recently even is that the Neanderthal genome is coming out and it's about 70% uh, done. It should be done completely here in the next couple years. So um, some of the results from this is we found out that the human genome actually has a surprisingly fewer number of genes than what we originally thought. There's about 23,000 genes, 20,000 of which have been confirmed through experimentation, and the other 3,000 are predicted through computer models, but we think they probably are genes as well. Um, chromosome 1 is the largest human chromosome and has about 3,170 genes, and the Y chromosome has the fewest uh, confirmed genes at 344. The average size of a gene is about 3,000 base pairs, with the, and that's though it varies, it can get, be much smaller or much larger. For example, the largest human gene is dystrophin, which is a 2.4 million base pair long gene, really, really long. For about half of the genes, we kind of know what their functions are, but for more than, more than half of them we're, of these genes, we still don't know what they do. And so this is where a lot of research is being done. About 2%, though, of those 3.2 billion nucleotides are only used in encoding instructions for the synthesis of proteins. So a surprisingly small percentage of all of our DNA actually makes proteins, actually goes through the process of transcription and then translation to make proteins. Most of actually what our genome is made up of are repeat sequences. So this is DNA that's repeated over and over again. Remember, we talked about those with um, STRs, small tandem repeats, that are used in the DNA profiling. So about 50% of the human genomes are made up of these repeat DNA sequences. The website that we'll go to in a little bit that, that um, stores all of this information and is integrating it all in, in conjunction with many other websites out there as well. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of different bioinformatic websites. But the main repository, this is called the primary database, is the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI. Now the growth of the of the of NCBI's um, database that stores all of this genetic information, which is called GenBank, has really been growing, especially in the last few years. As you can see, this looks like an exponential growth curve here. The Human Genome Project starts right back here, and they're just learning how to do things. But once they kind of um, the the process of doing DNA sequencing gets easier and more um, efficient, it really takes off and you have this huge growth. And so as of at least last, last year, last October, um, or actually a couple Octobers ago, I haven't updated this for a while, there were 145 billion base pairs with a, uh, coming from 157 million um, sequences. And you know, at that same time, I looked at the number of pro prokaryotes that had been completely um, sequenced and the ones that were in progress for a total of 2,500 um, and the number of eukaryotes at about 60, 650. So, you know, well over 3,000. I, I think we're approaching about 5,000 total right now. Now, the good thing is at the same time that all of this DNA data 
um, generation has been going on at leaps and bounds. We've also had a progress similar in um, computational power and storage power in computers. And so, you know, if you just look over the years, you can see the speed at which computers can now function and the amount of storage that we can have inside of computers has also greatly increased. So we have the ability now to kind of Google our Earth through the, the genome, right? So if you look, remember, we can take pictures of chromosomes, and that doesn't show us the actual genetics. But nowadays, we can actually computerize this. And this is found on that NCBI website, where you can go in and you can see, OK, here's a chromosome. And maybe I'm interested at this part of the chromosome, so I zoom in a little bit more. And now you start to see these little blue things appear. These blue things are genes. So you zoom in a little bit on a chunk of these genes, and now that you can actually see names across these, these short names. And maybe we're interested in this one called HD, which, which is the gene for Huntington's disease. And so we zoom in on that gene, and now we see that there's these longer lines with these with then just the horizontal lines in between. Well, remember how we talked about exons and introns? Well, the horizontal lines here represent exons. I mean, the vertical lines are the exons, and then the, the space in between are the introns. And so you can see that gene is made up mostly of introns with just a few ex with a number of exons in between. If we zoom in on just a couple of these, here's an exon, intronic DNA, DNA exon DNA, intron DNA, exon, intron, and so forth. And so you can also see that it's not that far of a stretch to see how you can take different combinations of exons and splice them together in alternative ways, what we call alternative splicing. And that's how one gene can produce more than one protein product. Well, we can even zoom in maybe a little bit more on part of this exon right down to the genetic code. And the other thing that these uh, databases store is not just the human genome sequence for one human, but they also are putting on there the human genome sequence for all of the humans that are being sequenced. And one of the things that you can start to see is every once in a while, there are differences. Now, humans, all humans on the planet, share DNA at 99.9% .9 the same. But of that 0.01% that is not the same, you can go in and find these mutations. And if these mu mutations happen to occur on genes and inside of a gene, inside of the exon of a gene, then that might be a good candidate to say, does that mutation cause a disease? And of course, if this, if this mutation here is not silent, that it's causing a change in an amino acid, it might be a good, a good case. And in fact, this mutation right here is one of the mutations that causes Huntington's disease.